Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth MIA Meets. My name is Armin Shaomian, and I am the president of MIA, the Music and Entertainment Industry Educators um, Association. Uh, MIA is in its 40th year, and while we had to cancel our annual summit in Washington, D.C. this past March, we are looking forward to bringing you a fully online virtual summit this October instead. So save the dates for October 2nd and 3rd this fall. Additionally, MIA is offering a free year of academic membership to all current and new members. We will be sending you an email for more information after this session. Meanwhile, please visit mia.org for the latest information. And if you'd like to reach me directly, my email is president at mia.org. Before we get started, I want to let you know that this meeting will be recorded for archiving purposes, as well as posted on our YouTube channel so that those who are unable to attend can still access the resources and the conversations shared during this session. Today's Mia Meets topic will focus on facing the challenges of applied lessons and performance ensembles. But first, I'd like to introduce to you Kelly Garner, who is a Mia board member and associate professor of contemporary voice and worship technology at Union University. Kelly. Hey, everybody. Um, wonderful to be here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I think we are all just trying to figure out what we're going to do, right? Uh, it's a crazy time in our world, but this, uh, hopefully this a uh, little get together that we're having. We can just share some ideas. I have asked a wonderful panel uh, of people to just come together with us here uh, to give us an idea of what they're doing in their institutions. Let me introduce all those folks to you. Um, first on my list here, and they're in no particular order, uh, David Scott, uh, professor of voice and department of voice at Berkeley. College of Music, uh, David, you're here somewhere. You can wave at folks. Uh, then we have William Powell. He's the director of choirs and ensembles or choral activities, I believe, at Auburn University. Rosephany Powell, she's professor of voice at Auburn University. Janet Hopkins, she is associate professor of vocal performance at the University of South Carolina. And Alexis Cole, who is professor of voice at SUNY Purchase in New York. Uh, she also is in the Gen Network with me and, and also has a company called jazzvoice.com. So I thought we would have quite a few uh, different perspectives. So why don't we just start to talk about what you're doing. Tell us what your institution, uh, your particular institution, is doing uh, and how they're going to approach applied lessons and performance ensembles for this fall. Who would like to begin? David, maybe, would you like to begin? Oh, sure, put me on the spot. Um, I, I'd be happy to. Okay. Um, so, uh, I, like Kelly said, I'm a uh, professor of voice at Berkeley and the voice department is the largest instrumental department at Berkeley. We have over a thousand voice principals. Um, I'm also the executive vice president of the Berkeley Faculty Union. So I'm, I've been pretty busy this year um, talking with the administration and figuring out what the plans are for the fall. So I'm sure like many of you, when spring break came in March, uh, that was pretty much the end of our semester. So um, since then, the college has been putting a lot of effort into figuring out how we can do a hybrid return the fall and the goal was always 60% online, 40% in person. And the 40% in person, none of that was gonna be applied lessons. Um, very little uh, ensembles. We don't have the space on our campus that we can do uh, distancing uh, on, with ensembles safely for the most part. There were a few ensembles that they thought they could run. Um, but the big change that happened at Berkeley was about a week ago, we got the announcement from our president that the entire semester for the fall is going to be online. Um, so obviously we're, gonna, we're, we're continuing to do our private lessons online and ensembles uh, are going to be tricky. So maybe that's just a quick introduction to what we're doing at Berkeley and we can talk more about specifics uh, later. Does that sound hey. good?
Oh, so sorry. Am I unmuted now? Okay, there I am. Uh, so sorry, David. Didn't mean to put you on the spot, but thank you for starting. Uh, who would like to go next? Rosephany or William? Or Janet? Okay. Uh, well, uh, at Auburn, uh, presently, what um, uh, we are considering doing, unless things change, because everything is fluid at this point, so, you know, weekly, we're getting updates. But presently, we have, uh, for applied study, uh, which is different from in the spring where we did go to Zoom and, you know, remote as far as applied study. Presently, we're planning to have voice lessons and uh, voice lessons will be provided in uh, large rooms. So for instance, I will be giving voice lessons in the recital hall and uh, we'll be using a singer's mask and of course, you know, a shield and uh, we'll keep the distance between me and the student at more than 20 feet. Um, but uh, juries at the end of the semester, uh, if things don't change, juries will be as they were uh, virtual. They will be done online. So uh, the, the other areas where we'll be having voice lessons will be in the choir room, again, at a distance, the, the faculty member on one side of the hall. So I guess we'll be doing a lot of shouting open, lift, all of these things. But that's that's where we are. And I'll allow William to tell what we plan for ensembles. Okay, thank you, Rosephany. The uh, ensembles, as we all know, it is it is gonna be tricky, but the uh, we've, I would say maybe a three step or three stage plan. The face-to-face -face plan would be for the singers, you know, we have entrances and exits marked for them to, you know, so that we don't, cross-pollinate uh, in those instances. We also have uh, right now, like at this very moment, there's a, I wish I could take the camera out and let you see what's going on in this building. It's like massive, massive construction or reconstruction, you know, with HIP, HIPAA filters and this, that, and the other. They're totally uh, gutting out uh, the uh, HVAC thing and just kind of cleaning it up and, and it really needed it, quite honestly. So those precautions are in place. Uh, they've installed some sanitizer things, sanitizer stations at the entrances. And so all those kinds of precautions are being uh, being put in place. The added precaution for us would be to wear uh, the masks. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the singer's mask. We were uh, looking into those. There's also, I just found out yesterday about a window mask that uh, is, is hot on the market and which allows, uh, it's like the shield and mask marry together and become one. And so, uh, uh, you know, I'm looking at that as well, but all that to say, that's, that's one stage. The second stage would be to do the combined virtual and, and in place and, uh, and, and with the face-to-face, -face, I should say, would be, we would stagger the rehearsals where, you know, sopranos one day, altos another day, to, you know, and that sort of thing quartets the next week to social distance in large spaces. And we are blessed to have a couple of large rehearsal spaces from which to choose, but we have also the added bonus of having lots of ensembles as you do at your institutions. And so it's hard to compete for that, those larger spaces. Last thing would be to go to delay or go total virtual. Um, uh, and that in and of itself is a whole nother discussion, but, but, uh, we're, we're based upon what's currently going around. We're, we're kind of really looking more seriously into that, but again, we don't know. So, um, uh, but we are approaching it with care. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to add that for our opera workshop, um, I am the opera workshop director uh, discuss that this will be a semester um, wherein having um, the, the, we will work more on each student singing an operatic aria, which then means that the instructor is working with only one student at a time. So we thought that would be better than trying to work on any sort of production 
or uh, scenes. So I think in many ways that's going to be a benefit to the student because they get that one-on-one -on -one time with that director uh, where they are trying to develop that character. So that's the way we're going to do the opera workshop ensemble. And the women's chorus, we, we, the, the choirs meet three days a week. And so right now, in this way, COVID-19 worked well for us because we have 50 singers in the women's chorus where we normally average between 35 or at most 40. But as William was saying, we're going to divide that group into three small ensembles and then spread them around the choir room when we meet. And then, as he says, if there is, if the, the university decides to go fully remote with the numbers of COVID increasing, um, then we will give them singing assignments that they will post to Canvas uh, for, for grading and showing that they're working on a particular songs. And uh, let me. Okay, go ahead. I, if you hadn't noticed, I just uh, uh, shared a couple of links, if you look in the chat, of what I was referring to, the singer's mask, if, for those who have not seen it yet, as well as the, um, the other mask I was telling you about. So I just wanted to reference that. Sorry, go ahead, Kelly. Well, I was just, uh, I had a thought, you know, uh, you guys, because there's several different sides to this. Uh, Y'all are thinking more probably from the classical. Like Alexis, uh, you and I come from the other side of more commercial jazz. Uh, do you teach a jazz choir at where you are, Alexis? I, no, we don't have a vocal ensemble. You don't we have, have, we have classical ensemble. choirs, but no jazz choir. There's, okay. only, there's only about eight majors. Well, I know that in our situation, we have uh, kind of both. And I know that we've even discussed uh, in-ear monitors and doing microphones yet standing apart you know but the the problem that starts to happen with that is expense you know so um i i was about to put a question in the chat for you william is with all those types of things the different masks you're talking about is the university um paying for that and helping you financially with all those things yes so uh we were actually going to require the students to purchase them, but what we would do would be to purchase them ourselves such that we don't have to deal with any delay. So we would, as a department, pur purchase the masks and then have the students to purchase them from us so that they're right here waiting for them to pick up. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry about the muting thing. Armin, feel free to mute me whenever you feel like it. But <laughs> uh, okay, Alexis uh, or, or Janet, either one, would you like to uh, tell us? Yeah, Alexis. Okay. Yeah, I, wrote, I just wrote a little list of the, some of the things that we're doing. We just had a meeting yesterday and we've, we've been meeting every other week which, with the students and the faculty together on, on Zoom every, um, you know, every other Wednesday which has been great because as everybody is aware, you know, things are changing by the day. So it's been great to keep the students updated and give them a sense of um, at least that, you know, as things are changing, that it's not arbitrary, you know, that, that it's based on the data that's coming in and thoughtful decision-making and, and research that, uh, you know, just that the, the, the head is helmed. <laughs> so, uh, so we're lucky at SUNY Purchase, we have lots of space. And um, of course, now there's a big motor going on of <laughs> somebody's, uh, great, leaf blowing, awesome. Um, anyway, uh, for my lessons, I'm gonna be, um, I'm gonna be doing them completely virtually because we, ha um, I was given, we were given the option for lessons and, and, and at our school, we only have uh, two choices of how we're telling the university that we're doing things. We can either say that we're gonna be in person or online, but really we're doing a lot of the classes as a hybrid situation. And, um, uh, but my, I'm gonna be completely online, but my classes are listed as, as, um, as in person because if a student only, uh, they're only allowing students that have in-person classes to live on campus. And uh, most, most of the students on our campus are gonna be home. Only uh, dancers, theater people, and music people, and maybe I think some science majors are going to be allowed to live on campus because they're greatly reducing all the housing. Um, so, so that's uh, that's why they're doing that. But but my my lessons are going to be virtual because because um, I was it, it was going so well, 
and they gave us the option. So I just decided to, to keep going online. Uh, classical voice lessons, they're going to meet in person and they're going to be using face shields. And they're also, they've moved out of their uh, studios into the larger uh, classrooms that are going to be empty because all the theory classes are going to be online. So uh, we also have uh, plexiglass, lots of plexiglass shields have been made and um, air purifiers have been, we've purchased about 15 air purifiers, very high quality for those rooms. And uh, let's see, uh, lots of other lessons, guitar lessons, piano lessons, all, most of those have, are gonna be 100% online. For our ensembles, our opera program is gonna be using plexiglass shields and they're gonna be in the largest ensemble room and they've limited the class size um, and they're also not doing any, you know, close, they're going to keep everybody socially distanced during the scenes, even though that's awkward. And um, for some of our other ensembles, brass ensembles and such, they're actually going to be meeting outside. We've talked about getting some um, like outdoor tents, like event tents. And so until it gets cold, we're going to try and do that because we do have, as I mentioned, we have a lot of space around our campus. And people are also being encouraged to practice outdoors as well for whoever that's possible for. Now for the singers, it's not possible to practice. I mean, you can practice outdoors, of course, but um, they're also going to, uh, they've assigned a, a suite of rooms, which are larger classrooms for the singers to practice in. And everybody in the whole uh, student body is gonna have to sign up for practice rooms so that we can, if somebody ends up with a virus, we can do, um, you know, contact tracing and figure out who else was practicing in that room and also to allow for some space between practice sessions for, you know, to open the doors. And uh, so we wonder, you know, how, how are we going to enforce that? We have some hall monitors. These are uh, the people who work in our performing arts center. They, they're union employees and I guess they've, they're repurposing them to all the buildings that are going to be open, the dance building and the theater building and us. And so we're going to have our own set of kind of hall guards. They're going to be monitoring, making sure no people who are uh, people who are not music students are not coming into the building because our building is sort of a throughway between a parking lot and uh, the rest of the campus and we don't want those people, we don't want anybody else in the building except for the students and teachers. And they're going to be, uh, you know, working with the students to make sure this system of uh, practice rooms works out. Uh, we've also put a capacity rating on the outside of each room based on its size and um, that's going to be enforced. And there are no group rehearsals after 10 p.m. People can individually rehearse all through the night, as always. Um, for the practice rooms, there are people. We have wipes, uh, spray, spray, and paper towel because nobody wanted drippy wipes on a piano. So those are going to be in the rooms and hand sanitizer. And um, that's all she wrote. So yeah, great. But that's. I mean, I feel like we're doing you know as much as can be done. The fa the decision to go to be hybrid. You know, the students seem somewhat content with that. They're happy that they're going to be able to be on campus, the ones who want to be. And um, there's been some question if a student doesn't want to be on campus, but their ensemble is meeting and they have a scholarship and they don't want to come, but the scholarship depends on them being, you know, in a, in a particular ensemble, how that's going to work. But, um, but basically, we're not forcing anybody to come to campus that doesn't feel safe or has someone you know, both teachers and students. And for that, I've, I've been really grateful. And ironically, I'm gonna be co-chairing the program this year while, um, while the director is on sabbatical, but I won't be there. <laughs> so it's gonna be a very interesting uh, semester that this all went that way, but I'm, I'm happy I'll be able to be in a position to help the students and, and teachers, you know, communicate and adjust with the jazz program. I'll be kind of a liaison between the students and, in the jazz program and the uh, director of the conservatory. That's that's some great ideas, Alexis. And I, you know what? I love the idea of having, I told my chair at one point, jokingly, that I might even have a lesson outside if I was going to be forced to have it in a very small room. Uh, but that's, I mean, it's not a bad idea because I'd rather be out amongst the trees and the birds, right? And uh, you being far away from people and being able to put that space there. So I think that's a very good idea. Uh, Janet. We've got to get to you. Where are you, Janet? You're not on. I'm Here on I am. Okay. You got me. Tell us, tell us what you guys are doing. Okay. So we decided at the end of the uh, spring semester that we already were going to be doing juries this semester online. So whether or not we virtually open or um, hybrid, we're still already doing juries online. We have. A few, we, we, none of us have to teach in person if we don't want to. 
but they have, because of our theory classes, also being online. We have the classrooms available. They've assigned us to different studios and different rooms to teach in. Uh, we don't have quite enough, although some teachers are going to teach. We have uh, one who works at a Presbyterian church. He'll be teaching at his church with his students. Another one will be teaching at his church with his students. Part of mine will be at my home, should I do in person, and that's not, I'm not definite yet. I'm still waiting to last minute to see. I have students who have chosen to have lessons online, either because of their family situation. I have uh, two students who, I have three Chinese students, grad students, who were supposed to be coming, and two of them have deferred for January, and we are saving their scholarship for them. And the third one is actually just going to take virtual voice lessons uh, and virtual classes from China. And of course, we all know that whole situation about if they're not residences in the schools, the issues, but it's not a problem because she's all going to be online. Uh, I thought I'd show you the setup I have in my house uh, because right now I've been teaching all summer uh, private students. I don't teach more than a half an hour at a time. And the other half an hour of a lesson, if it's an older student, is an online lesson, unless they want to come back later in the week. I have time in between all of my live students where I do online, so there's space. But the reason I feel that I can probably teach in my home okay is, so here we are in my lovely living room and my lovely piano. So right behind me, I have a window that opens up easily. The street is not that congested. I have a brand new HEPA filter that I just bought, which is to clear 800 square feet. I bought a plexiglass shield. I don't know if you can see it very well. I have it set up on a table. I've moved it a little bit closer then I would actually use it for teaching just so I could kind of show it to you. Notice the can of uh, lights all underneath each, uh, each student sprays that plexiglass shield and the music stand. And of course I have a little mirror set up here so they can use that as well. And here's where their view is. And so that's, fine. that's working fine for me. Um, I would like a little more space, but I feel pretty comfortable since I am at a good distance and can get fresh air in. At the university, they've assigned me to a room of 800 square feet, which is fabulous, but it's in the basement of our performing arts building. And that means there's not gonna be any fresh airflow. And with that study that's come out in Colorado, they say 30 minutes should be the limit of teaching in person because the aerosol goes quite a bit farther after that half an hour. And if I'm in a classroom and sitting there doing nothing for a half an hour with my workload, I would have 60 hour a week waiting a half an hour between each student. So that's where I am. I also have uh, my own face shield and mask that I wear while I'm teaching. And I don't know if any of you have tried it, but when you put this face shield on and you sing, it hurts your ears because there's, it's like sending that sound directly back in your ear, like singing in one of those small live practice rooms. It's actually very difficult and I'm not sure how the students are going to do it unless they're keeping at a mental piano level, but that's just my two cents on that. And that's it. Can I ask a question, Janet? Yeah. Um, it looks like you've really tricked out your home studio really well. Um, does that, is, is there, does your college have any uh, grants for that available or does that all have to come out of your own pocket? It's all out of my own pocket. The only benefit I'm looking at is since I'm going to do some teaching in my home, uh, I should be able to write off part of the area and all of these things in my taxes next year. They didn't let us do it this year if it was all W-9, but I'm hoping that because it's for university displacement, I'll be able to at least get that written off. I think we can do a quick poll because there were a couple questions 
that we wanted to ask. And so here's the first one. And it's really to get a better idea of, of the 16 participants today. If you are teaching online this fall, in person or mix, I know some schools still are undecided and they're supposed to make a decision tomorrow actually. So I'm just kind of curious where your university stands. Um, but it looks like we have a, a decent split vote between um, online or a little bit of a mix so far. So go ahead and vote. If you can see, uh, if you're logged on through the website, you should be able to, uh, uh, to see that as well. For some reason, Armin, I'm not able to vote. I don't know what that might be. Might it's probably because you and I are hosts, so that's okay, probably gotcha. why. Yeah. We get to just watch it. <laughs> and guys, I, I just threw a question on there. <clears throat> uh, it might be a, a controversial question, <laughs> but uh, you know me. I'm just I'm just going to throw it. If I think it, I'll probably say it. Um, have any, has anybody thought, I'm just looking at Janet and how she has really worked on her studio at home and spent that money and all that. I mean, where is the teacher stimulus in some of this, you know? I mean, we are frankly also on the front lines and I would like to encourage, uh, now I haven't done it yet. I'm not going to pretend that I have, but I think we probably should talk to our senators and representatives because we are doing the very same thing that Janet's doing and buying a few little things. I, I mean, I teach a technology class too, and I, I bought a little video streaming mixer yesterday that cost me way more than I wanted to spend on it, but I'm just trying to find a few ways to do picture in picture, split the screen, whatever I can do uh, to try to make it a little more engaging uh, for the students because as much as I love Zoom and, and, and being able to use it, as y'all probably have already discovered, sometimes it's, it's a little static, you know? You have one, all this picture and then it's just you and you try to look around at the different people, but it's kind of hard to do that. So um, I just didn't know if anybody else had some opinion on that or not, or maybe if I'm just crazy. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think I'm gonna probably send my uh, senator and representative a, a, a question and just say, you know, is that any possibility? Because we've been freaking out lately trying to figure out what we're gonna do. Any other thoughts, questions? I was just gonna jump in and say that I am aware of, uh, of colleagues of mine at other institutions that are not teaching music, but they're in business programs. And they were given between $500 and $1,000 and things shut down in March just so from the school saying, here's money from the department, go buy technology and make your home office work. Um, I think it was easier that way the school saw it rather than faculty going back and forth with their chairs and just too much. Um, so I think that was an easy and I personally think probably somewhat cost effective way, but I haven't heard many school uh, music programs doing that as far as giving folks money to go. Janet, I'm curious, how much did your setup cost? Because you have a nice filter and you have, I know those shields mm -hmm. are expensive. This shield actually was not expensive. It's, um, I don't know, maybe $10 on Amazon. Oh, and I mean the, the plexiglass. No, oh, the plexi. That was about $150. And then the HEPA filter was 270 because I wanted the one that would cover 800 square feet from the entire, and then especially with the window open and air coming in and out. Um, so, you know, it's a, and then my $250 headphones. So it's quite a bit of money. And I will say, if you've ever sung with these masks on, it, to demonstrate to the student at least the sound, it really isn't hard singing in a mask. It's much harder singing with the shield on which is, and I know somebody put it up there, it is not as good as a mask uh, for, because aerosol can still come underneath that mask and go out or get in if the teacher's wearing it. It's almost like, Janet, you have to, I mean, it's almost like you have to have the mask and the shield on, but then how can you teach voice that way too? Um, 
I've started to think sometimes, and, and Alexis, as you said, and several others about it going all virtual, I almost think sometimes that works better, except you having to, uh, you know, breast support. Uh, how do you check that online? If anybody's got ideas. You know, I, I actually had a really successful technique lesson with someone yesterday. I've been mostly uh, doing things like talking about you know, for the, my seniors, you know, building their website online last semester, that's, we did that for one of the more advanced students and, um, you know, working on swing field and other like, uh, things that are more, um, you know, not, not technical in nature, but, but, you know, easier to do with a bad internet connection, <laughs> frankly. Uh, but, but, uh, just, yeah, just yesterday, actually, I had a student for the first time, um, from my website, jazzvoice.com. And uh, she, I could tell that what she wanted to work on phrasing, but I knew what she really needed to work on was some technique, you know, fundamentals. So I, I actually, you know, we've really managed, you know, I stood up, I stood away from the, the camera so that I could show her my body and show her some stretches that I do. And she did them and, uh, you know, it, and, and some of the things that are working so well with the Zoom is the fact that they can video record the lesson. I've been wanting for years to set up a little video camera, you know, two camera, thing in my studio so that people could take the lesson video home with them and I haven't done it. So this has been a great opportunity to have the video of the lesson. Um, I also feel like, you know, when I'm accompanying them in the studio, you know, 30% of my attention or whatever is probably taken away by, by accompanying. And here I'm just, they're playing with a track and it's not great, but um, you know, I'm like looking in their mouth. I'm looking right at them. hundred percent of my attention is focused on them. We're also really close together in a way, like my face is here, their face is there. So uh, that's the thing, Janet, like looking at your setup, I just feel like that would, I, I mean, I know you're gonna have great success and people who wanna learn, by the way, I feel like are gonna learn, whether it's over Zoom, far apart in a classroom, you know, and the ones who didn't, the ones who weren't doing great before this, they're just still not gonna be doing great, but it's not because of this, you know? So these are just, uh, that's one of the things that I feel confident in after teaching online this, uh, this spring. But um, uh, anyway, I feel like the, being a little bit closer with the camera is both safer, infinitely safer, and, um, and probably makes up for the difference of not being physically together. That was, I, I was so impressed. You know, I've, I've been tr talking about teaching online for years and I never did it. I was always kind of putting it off. And um, I just thought, wow, it was, it so far exceeded my expectations. And that, that's what led me to create the website jazzboys.com. And um, now I have a lot of, uh, I have over 20 teachers. Kelly is one of them, you know, teaching for me online. A lot of famous touring singers that you'd never would think of to take a lesson with are not touring right now. So they're online with me and other, you know, heads of, heads of jazz vocal programs that are renowned across the country because everybody's teaching online now. So it's, uh, I think it's a fundamental shift in how we're going to be learning in the future. And I, I, I think it's, um, you know, I miss people, but I think it's, 90% amazing. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's where I landed down on, on all this. The only issue that I felt that I had uh, in the spring was when students don't have a strong connection or issues with the internet. And some of the students, because of their family backgrounds and because everything was so shut down fully at that point, it was so difficult to have the lesson when the, the sound was distorted, you know, or there were delays. Um, how are you all dealing with students who have issues with the internet? What I did in the spring and it worked really well is I took my hour long lessons and I had them 45 minutes and the other 15 minutes they had to send me 24 hours before their lesson, a video of them performing the song for the week so that at least we had that. If it cut off during their lesson, we can talk about the performance that was pre-recorded because that at least will work. It also made them listen to the performance and record it several times because they weren't going to accept and send me something that wasn't very good. So that's what I did. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did similar things to Janet the, um, when people had internet problems or whatever it was, have them record it and then talk about it together while we watch it together. 
Yes, yeah, same here. I just didn't know if if there were any options for when you're live, if you know anything that can be done. If you know a student, because this student consistently, one point he was at his brother's apartment, another point he was at his his mother's home, and based on where they lived, we never could have strong lessons. So we did do a lot that was pre-recorded, but um, you know just him having the uh, ability to sing before me was a, quite a challenge. Yeah, some some of our students uh, on jazzvoice.com are coming from Russia, and I felt so bad. A, a girl came on; she wanted to sing in one of the master classes a few weeks ago, and her connection was it was so bad. And then in uh, the language barrier, and she was having trouble with the muting the microphone. There was, but um, I I have to say when she finally got it together, I mean her speed didn't the internet speed didn't increase, so it was still choppy, but you know, she still was able to sing. The teacher was still able to give her something. I feel like, you know, we have to, <laughs> I'm like, I have like a life, a life philosophy of lowered expectations leading to happiness. So we like, we, this is a great opportunity for us to all like lower our expectations, not, not of excellence of students singing, but like of how much we're going to be able to deliver and just like Wow, it's amazing that we're able to deliver anything. My, I have one student, you know, and this, uh, you know, it's, this is a great time to recognize how um, inequality is affecting people in every way. Just like you know, more people of color are being affected by COVID and, and dying of COVID. You know, also like my my students who you know live in neighborhoods of color don't have as good internet access, which is insane in New York City. You know, and so I, and I had one student, she was living in an apartment with her whole family, eight, eight of them in her, and they were all walking around behind her in a small apartment because they were all home. You know, some of the other kids were grown too. You know, it was really hard to teach her. And that's the one, and she's a super, super talented, amazing, you know, student, award-winning, literally student. And um, so she's the one we worked on her website all season. And hopefully that's going to be something that will, you know, because it was, it would have been impossible for me to do a singing lesson with her. So just finding... I don't know, like low, lowering our expectations and finding the, the ways that we can have an impact and what we can do and exploiting that and this and knowing that this is a temp, hopefully God, you know, willing a temporary mm -hmm. time where we just have to, but I don't know. I, I mean, cor choral and ensemble teachers are in a whole nother, you know, I love what you said, uh, Rosephine, uh, sorry, Rosephine, right? Rosephine. Rosephine, right. I'm sorry. You know, what you're doing with the uh, ARIA lessons instead of having um, opera students together. You know, we just have to find these where we can angle in. I'm going to bring up some. Oh, I'm sorry, David. David. Oh, yeah. Ahead. I was just going to add another little tidbit. This isn't this is more for classroom teaching, but you can apply this for um, ensembles or private as well. Sometimes if you're if you're trying to show a video through Zoom, there's a lot of problems um, getting it out to all the students. So what some of my colleagues have been doing is they've been taking the video, uploading it to YouTube, sending out the link saying, okay, everybody go to YouTube, watch this video, we'll reconvene in five minutes and we'll talk about it. That's great. Well, one uh, idea I had as Alexis was talking, that's a great idea. Uh, and you know what, it is more stable, right? That's just something that um, can help in some ways. Um, you know, one little idea I just had hit me when Alexis was talking about ensembles is, you know, we have all seen some of those uh, virtual choir type of situations happen uh, throughout the uh, spring and summer. And I had a friend, he's a jazz choir ensemble director in Chicago. He did like a virtual choir. He sent them a track and basically had them listen to the track on one device and then another device had them record it and then he had them send all those vocals in and he just put them all together and edited them all and all that sort of thing. Um, I think that's a good way for maybe some of the tech kids in your department to kind of utilize their skills as well and be given that task to kind of put that together. And then for the, he told me, his name is Drew DeHaan. I don't know if you know him or not, but he's, he's got quite a few, he's doing very well in Chicago area. Um, he told me it was quite good for the kids' ears uh, in the ensemble, that it made them really have to listen and really hone in on their part alone and really know their part and record that and then send it in. And then 
once it was all put together, the kids were amazed. You know, they're like, oh, wow. You know, we kind of got all of our, and record themselves. I think they did a video, like a virtual type of a choir type thing like that. So that and, might be one thing that you could use too. And, and Kelly, William did that with our choir. And you yes. might be able to share, you know, what some of the challenges were. Well, right. what was your process? Yeah, so, so um, what we did, this was back in May, and I have some technological savvy, but not enough experience with that particular project. So uh, I was approached by our uh, media specialist in our College of Liberal Arts who said, hey, uh, can we do something? And I thought, yeah, this is a great idea. We did our alma mater. And it was well received by the alumni and, you know, Auburn faculty, I mean, excuse me, Auburn community. We, the alma mater is a common tune among all of our choral students. We have seven different choirs. And so we invited all students to participate. Not all of them did, of course. And so like Kelly was saying, we, we had the student, you know, I created uh, conducting click track, uh, you know, video of me conducting and then, uh, you know, had the little MIDI in the back. It just, it took me forever to put that together. So uh, again, like I say, I, I understand it, but it's just, it just was time consuming because that's just not what I do um, on a regular basis. So, uh, but yeah, do doing that helped me. I think the next time I do it, I'll be quicker. But uh, anyway, so, but like you say, it's a great opportunity for the students who uh, are in that particular area in commercial music to to you know be really be part of it so the but the process was that collected the videos put all those in a box folder sent those to our CLA media specialist and he put the video together through Adobe Premiere Elements um, and he had a little trick on how he did that and uh, you know turned it out and it was uh, it it was it was it was great. It was like I said, it was well received. It was on the earlier side of the pandemic, so people were really heartwarmed by it. So, but yeah, but that's that's that. Other thoughts, anybody? Uh, I did a similar thing with my ensemble, but uh, not including video, just audio. So um, when we when we left for the for spring break for the semester, um, I had came up with a big list of tasks for all the students and everybody picked different tasks that they wanted to do. And I actually had the students uh, make the, the basic tracks and um, sort of manage the project on different songs, like manage the rhythm section recordings. Um, you know, it, I ended up having to edit it at the end, which uh, like William said, it's a, it's a ton of work. Um, but uh, I think it was good for the students to, to take some of that responsibility. Okay, I just had another thought. Good, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, thank you both for those ideas for ensembles because I think that's very important as well. I would also like to um, endorse what somebody said a few minutes ago about us just trying to find any way we can to help these kids with their careers. I mean, if if it's bad internet connection and something's not working, we we've got to find something else, right? We've got to if they're songwriters, um, maybe encourage them to do their songs, record them, video them, send them in, um, you know, talk to them about how their vocal was on that song, uh, maybe talk to them a little bit about building their careers, building their fan bases, all those sorts of things, um, I think are things that we could fall back on if suddenly everything, the rug pulls out from under us, you know, because guys, with what we've seen this year, don't we all know that the rug can pull out from under us all of a sudden? Um, so I think I would encourage everybody to sort of have some of those things in your back pocket uh, that we can rely on. And because I think as we are uh, teaching voice lessons, doing ensembles, ensembles, what are they for? Teaching the kids to sing in harmony, right? All those sorts of things, teaching them how later down the road they might do background vocals, all those sorts of things. Uh, we're basically trying to teach them how to build what we're teaching into some kind of career. So, uh, you know, hard as this may seem, I think if we can just continue to have a few of those things in mind, we're trying to help them just move down the road a, a little bit further with every single applied lesson 
and every time we get in front of them in those ensembles. Um, so uh, one little question on the ensembles, those of you that have ensembles, are you, so everybody's spread out in the room? Is that the way you're doing it? Like six feet apart? Is that what you're doing? Actually, we're aiming for more than six feet. Okay. Sorry, yeah, I was unmuted, but yeah, we're, <laughs> we are aiming for a minimum of 10 feet. And, uh, you know, again, with the masks and everything else. <laughs> and we, we too are, uh, we're reducing, I think you addressed this earlier, William, that yes. you're addressing the amount of time. I think uh, Janet- I did not. Okay, we're doing for, so the class meets for 50 minutes, but we're singing for about 30 minutes. Then William has devised a plan for uh, half an hour, sometimes more, the, the room being available. And then the next group that has an hour only sings for about 30 to 40 minutes. So he's put together a schedule um, for spacing and giving the room a chance to uh, air out. So I think at this point, and then, like I said, you know, ensembles for us are generally one credit, even though they're, they're scheduled to come three days a week that's always more work than the student is getting credit for. So they'll actually meet for the one day that they're getting the credit for, since we'll be dividing the class up into three different days. Any other thoughts on that, how you're approaching that? Janet, that was a, a something, you said something about 45 minutes and then doing a 15 minute video but that's for applied lessons, right? Didn't you say that? Yes. And I've also sent all, all of my students a warm up video so that they can sing with it. Because if you trust them to do it on their own, they may not do their whole range. They may not do enough time. So uh, even though it took a little bit of time, it was worth it because I just ex expect them, and they know I expect them to sing with that warm up video every day. So I know things are getting done the way I want it. Okay, I may ask a question here that is completely um, crazy and you're all going to say no to. <laughs> but I just, I know at uh, my particular institution, we are still trying to have a few performances on the calendar. H or have y'all completely wiped those out or where do you stand on some of those? I'll speak first. Uh... I originally had some uh, some a performance or two scheduled and I have not followed up on those because I just um, I'm just real hesitant and at the very, very most I'm thinking if anything, uh, we would have an outdoor performance and you know, as you know, being here in the deep south. <laughs> November is still summer so uh but yeah it's 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 uh, that's that's about the way that I would go and we probably wouldn't do that. I'm seeing lots of uh, that in the in the uh, chat that they have canceled pretty much everything. That's good to see because I think that's where we're going, um, guys. That this has been this is just wonderful to be able to see kind of what everybody's doing. Uh, and and just as a note, uh, I, I, we're not done with our discussion, but just as a note, I know Armin is going to send out or get this posted. Um, I think even even send out the chat. I think sometimes he saves the chat. And so you can kind of read through some of those later. Because uh, I love seeing what everybody's doing. Um, any other thoughts from our panel? Uh, yeah, I was gonna say uh, about concerts, we're gonna have them at school, but no audience will be present. And so they're gonna, uh, I guess it's set up like a video. I, I think we were already streaming some concerts. We were, we were, it wasn't, I think they could uh, do more to make it more popular, which probably this COVID will make it more popular because there's no option. But um, yeah, we're gonna be having live performances. And I actually did my first one uh, last week, I performed at William Patterson University and um, you know, with other musicians with no audience and it was broadcast a few nights later. And, and I have to say it's, I've been doing my own solo shows at my, at my cottage here, but um, that was like a, a, a really deep experience after not performing with people for so long. And I think that the audience really, um, you know, uh, it's, it's one thing to have all these different people on the screen, you know, that haven't been playing together, but, but it is really still 
very special and important to have um, have live performances. So I think it's a great happy medium, if you will, to have to have these the musicians together and not an audience and be broadcast. So that's that's what SUNY Purchase is doing, and I think it's good. One of I'm sorry. One of our biggest issues is students who have degree recitals that can't be postponed, especially the ones that had them in the spring that were postponed. Um, and some we. Uh, they did because they would have stopped their graduation. For any that were not necessary for May graduation, we've asked them to postpone. Well, now we're in the situation again where, first of all, does the accompanist feel safe playing with the singer? And rehearsals, our, our re practice rooms are small. They've talked about trying to put some kind of a, a device so that a pianist can be in one room and the singer can be in the other room and they can be communicating. So we're still working on that kind of thing. So the recitals are the biggest issue. Of course, um, audience would be only family if, if them, and it would be live streamed. But what about when an accompanist is not comfortable practicing with the singer? How do we handle that with recitals? Yeah, we, we, um, the pianist I was working with, I mean, it was a large ensemble uh, a septet, but the pianist was especially concerned and they had us on the stage. He was spaced so far. They had him like on the other side of the stage and the, you know, everybody else was over here. So he's, he's not even in a lot of the shots of the live stream, but I know, I mean, he wiped off the piano before and after and um, yeah, just really spaced very far away. But I think that that kind of a closed captioning or closed circuit uh, they use that in a lot of studios too. So that's a great, that's a great option. And you shouldn't have to deal with lag if you get that kind of system. People use that all the time in, in the studio. But um, yeah, that's... we did that too. Some of our some of our students um, did uh, video videos as a uh, to to supplement their recital um, credits. You know, they they produced kind of we just let them be creative and they came up with amazing stuff one student collaborated with three dancers and had them like dancing you know took video of them dancing at their homes like and put it to her music it was it's you know it's not what we're used to but it can be amazing wonderful um somebody we're going to go on for a, probably till about 12 30 with any discussion that anybody would like to have uh, but I think one of our panelists said something to me about needing to leave early. David, was that you? Or yeah, something? I have to you have have any about. More, more thoughts from you? Any other thoughts from you? Uh, no, I mean, we're all, we're all fumbling our way through this together, aren't we? So uh, I really appreciate these kinds of opportunities to learn from what my colleagues around the country are doing. So thanks for inviting me and, and uh, keep it up. This is great. Thank you for coming, David. Appreciate right. it so much. Um, Cheers. Thank other, you, other thoughts, and I, you know, panelists, I would, if it's okay with you, I'd like to ask our entire Armin, if that's okay, like all of our folks that are here, just field questions from any of them, and maybe they would have some questions for you or comments, ideas they might have. Uh, so, any of our folks that have joined us, would are there any comments from you guys? or questions. I've seen some good questions in the chat. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in if you don't mind. Hello, colleagues. I bring you greetings from Tennessee State University in Nashville. I uh, want to circle back, Kelly, to something you said about us really making extra effort to help our teacher, I mean, help our students in a career, you know, they're trying to pursue this. Um, I just might want to remind everybody that a lot of the professional groups have had great summer series webinars all summer. Um, uh, you mentioned songwriting specifically, Kelly. I mean, BMI, ASCAP, they're all great information that can augment our classes, or we could just point our students in that direction and let them go. Um, I'm about 30 episodes deep into a series uh, produced by Endeavor Content. Uh, you know, they bought William Morris years ago they represent talent all across the board i've taken copious notes this summer that i can't wait to share in my content so just a a, a quick add to this conversation that don't forget the professional groups um, musicbiz.org is a great one comes to mind right away uh, aiva is another great one I, oh i should preface that we have i come from the commercial music program at tsu so uh, all that 
And uh, just to share a little bit about our perspective at TSU real quick, uh, all our secondary ensembles have been canceled. We're only offering primary ensembles. And of those, the only ones that are meeting face-to-face -face are the wind ensembles. You can't keep the marching band down. But our, our pop ensembles, commercial ensembles, which I coordinate totally online, that's been a challenge, as I'm sure some of you can relate. But um, um, so, yeah, just putting that out there. And I uh, hope oh, there goes my camera again. Uh, but I appreciate all these comments. We have a question asking, how are you doing pop ensembles online? Okay, well, it was already alluded to, and I apologize for my camera blinking. I don't know what that's about, but okay. Uh, I would say it's my disco ball, but that's upstairs in the bedroom. But, um, oh, did I say that out loud? We, um, you know, this, this whole experience is somewhat a recursive opportunity for us because we're having to teach to our students the very way that we're having to teach. I mean, this is what the industry has come to, virtual concerts and all these kind of things, Facebook concerts. But to answer the question, we've had to pick songs. Like this summer, I had an ensemble. I sign the songs, I find the tempo, I send the click track, and then, you know, Johnny and Susie and Bobby and Devin, they all add their parts send it back to me and we have to put it together. Uh, it's been a challenge as some of you've already mentioned, there's inconsistency in technology. Some of them don't have, um, you know, the laptop they need, this kind of thing. Then there's the availability. Some of them work in spite of what's going on. And then there's just the, uh, the lag time between coaching and interpretation. You know, if, for example, if you're recording a, 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 a a pop tune, this actually happened this summer, and your saxophone player is a jazzer, and he swings all his eighth notes, then that's just more time I gotta track him down and say, no, it's one and two and one and, you know, that kind of thing. So it's been a real learning curve. Uh, but to answer the question, it's been piecemeal, and we've entertained the idea of, of well as in, uh, incorporating our music and technology classes and let them assemble these, uh, tracks together so that's how we're doing it mark i would encourage you just because i mean technology is one of those things i teach at union i would encourage you to make the students do it as difficult as it might be uh they may feel like they're behind the eight ball and they may say i can't do it but guess what logic and pro tools they can go i, I mean i've worked in logic i've always been a pro tools girl uh, i've been an uh, Pro Tools certified since 2005. I had never really gotten into logic deeply. And I just started making myself do some of that in the summer. So it's possible for them to just dive in and start learning some of that stuff. And so make them do it because I'll tell you, they will learn more from doing it. And, and it will it will save us a whole lot of time. We've got yeah. we've got plenty more to do, right? Yes, and, and what I've found, you mentioned being behind the curve. It's me that's behind the curve. I've found my students are very intuitive um, about, they've grown up with this technology. I'm, I still have cassette players at my house. So, you know, <laughs> but it's a good point. Taylor, I saw you had um, raised your hand, I think. Yeah, I was just going to comment. I, um, hello, I, Taylor Smith. I am, uh, I teach at a community college in San Diego County. Uh, we're pretty small. Um, and we are 100% online next semester. No class, no students on campus, no classes on campus. Um, and so we have three performing ensembles at our college. Uh, we have a concert band, a large choir, and then a pop music ensemble. And I direct the pop music group. Uh, and we, in, I'm actually the chair of the department as well. So that comes with other tasks, which meant uh, talking to the director of the band and the choir. And we decided to cancel both of them for the fall. 
because it was just, you know we the experience that we had of trying to do it online wasn't a total waste of time but it wasn't band and it wasn't choir it was a very different class and to do that for a whole semester just they decided that wasn't worth it uh, for the students or for them and then for my class my my pop music group i was inclined to do the same but i talked to the students and they were really interested in continuing to try to do it online next semester. Uh, and part of it was that they felt like if they came into it, knowing that that's what it was going to be, that it was going to be them in front of a camera and not coming to play in the room with everybody else, uh, that they came into it knowing that, that they would basically, they would have a, a better time with it. Um, so we're venturing into that world this next semester um for my pop band now that's a relatively small group i mean it's about 12 students total on any individual song it's a maybe six or so singers and instrumentalists uh, and so what we are trying to do and what we tried to do at the end of last semester was to similar to what people brought up about the whole virtual choir thing which is each person will play their part in their house with a camera and then send them to me and then I've got to try to figure out a way to put them all together. And then that equals our concert, so to speak. Uh, now, our initial plan in the fall or this last spring, excuse me, was to basically just do everything that we would have done in the concert that way. And we learned after about a month that that was just not going to happen. It was way too much. Uh, you know, we were going to do an hour long concert, uh, you know, 10 songs or something. and we got two songs done and it was way more work. And so we pulled back a bunch. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, my experiences with that uh, has been that it's, you know, it's really kind of hit or miss with the students because I have some students who like their only computer is a cell phone. And so like asking them to do any sort of editing on their end is, is a no go. Uh, and some of them even, you know, I've had to loan out some instruments because like they signed up for the class partly so that they get their hands on some nice instruments that we own at the college that they don't have anymore and things like that. So that's been a, that's been a tricky part of all of this uh, is kind of the access that they have. And then just, um, you know, it's a, it's a ton of work as people have already brought up. So that's just been my experience. I did want to just, um, I know Rosephany mentioned earlier about the quality of streaming, you know, music or singing live. And we briefly touched on the lack of technology for some students. I know here in South Carolina, the university was pretty good at making sure faculty had access to a website where we could fill out a form if a student simply did not have technology, whether it was a laptop or internet access, it kind of asked, you know, this is right after spring break when we all all of a sudden had to move online. But the, the issue I noticed is that a lot of students live in small communities where there isn't even internet, even if they paid for it. So they are essentially, their only access was those satellite services, which are very limited and very spotty. You can't stream. I was teaching a regular um, music business course and even the lectures would work. So I'm just curious if anybody else has had issues like that and also if any of your universities um, have offered some sort of stipend or support when it comes to students checking out laptops or giving them technology so they can at least now that some schools know that in the fall we are going to be online they have at least had some time to plan ahead is anybody else offering this for students i know as faculty we're kind of expected to pay for it and have it uh, and most of us you know we have laptops at home but anybody else as far as universities offering um, actual hardware for students, Alexis. Yeah, we, um, we've we've I I am not one hundred percent sure of the status of this, but we've discussed offering USB mics to uh, students who are going to be taking lessons from home, uh, you know, from from the college. Anyone else or anything about actual having internet? Because I know Taylor, you said you know for some cell phone, that's it. Yeah, so our college uh, did make some uh, both laptops and like Wi-Fi hotspots available to students that that if they don't have reliable internet at home, they can take this little box that basically connects them to cell service to get on the internet. Uh, there was it was pretty limited in numbers. I think they only gave out a couple hundred out of about nine thousand students, so it wasn't you know 
widely available, but they did do that to some extent um, to the most needy students, because we do have some areas that we serve that are quite remote, quite rural, even some students on the, uh, on the south side of the Mexican border that come across take classes that were being served with these devices. Um, so we have done a tiny bit of, of that. Um, but I, I can't say that I know much about the criteria they use as to who gets it and who doesn't. I don't, I don't know the insides of that. Yeah, I had a, a student who did not have internet hardly at all. It was very spotty. And this was even in Jackson, uh, but he lived sort of out in remote part uh, of the area. And then he also had um, uh, grandparents that he lived with who, especially when the virus started, were afraid for him to kind of go out or, or do anything. Um, so, you know, he had trouble even going to Starbucks to like find some internet or doing that. So that was an issue as well. And I just had to try to give him, um, you know, assignments and, and do the best we could with him. Taylor shared a link as well to the virtual concerts. And thank you, Mark, as well for sharing. By the way, all these links that are shared, um, when I send you guys a follow-up email when this is on YouTube, I will include those links in the comments so folks can access those as well. Any other comments or things you want to share? I know we're a little bit over the hour and I wanted to kind of do a, a wrap up. I think it would be great if we can do a, a kind of a meet again as a follow-up perhaps mid to end of September and just kind of see how's your fall semester going? What have you learned now that it's kind of fully online for most of us and um, maybe some more tips and tricks um, to now that we have done it for a while? Yeah, I think at this point, Armin, right, we, we're just all trying to share ideas and we really don't know for sure how it's going to go as we get into it uh, quite yet. So maybe when we do meet, that's a great idea, Armin, maybe when we do meet later, we'll say, hey, this is working, this didn't work, <laughs> you know, um, so that's a great idea. Any other thoughts? I was just thinking how this is, um, you know, the pandemic's an opportunity to uh, really uh, look under the hood and see what we need to be working on in some ways, like, I mean, for years, my you know friends who live abroad have been saying i can't believe america doesn't have better internet you know and and you know in my country we have everybody has internet everybody has good internet and it's cheap and the fact that we haven't gotten that together and we've let you know corporations have their way and you know not not made them i know when they when, like now they want to bring in 5g or whatever and and the uh, politicians could make them have to guarantee to put it in low income neighborhoods and they they've you know they they make a happy medium but it's not it doesn't actually get the job done and we just need to be realizing that um you know without that the internet is the way that people are going to be able to make an income and that it's only dividing the income gap with when, when people don't have this good infrastructure and we should see it as a as a, an infrastructure just like a, a, the electric grid or water and and be be maybe maybe not if not providing it for free to all of our citizens you know at least making sure that everyone can access it because it's just inexcusable in this time i don't know what people are supposed to do without the internet <laughs> it's my whole life you know it's right now it's literally is my whole life i have no one <laughs> nothing <laughs> except the internet so um you know and also the same thing like like things we've been meaning to do like uh streaming all of our concerts and really making that a feature bringing in people from all over the world to our colleges, I think that's really going to be helped through this too. So I think, you know, keeping an eye on the things that we can take away from this god awful semester and, and make part of our regular um, programming is, is and, and using that for outreach and for um, recruiting. I just think there's a lot of, of great takeaways. You know, nobody's going to like this semester, but how valuable would it be if we could take away some wonderful things that make our schools and our society, our country, a better place to live? So that's my parting thought. Uh, okay, yeah. Oh, Janet. I, I, I meant to mute, not. 
<laughs> Camera <laughs> off, done. <laughs> um, one of the things I fear is that there's so many, I believe it was Mark said, that, you know, there's so many great professional groups that are available for the students to um, masterclass with and view, but how do we tell these students that we've just taken possibly a career that would have supported them and taken all the money away? Like we've got all of our professional musicians who are not working and who are not bringing in income. And yes, it's wonderful. They're doing things for free. Um, giving back is great. However, you know, what do we say to the kids? It's like, guess what? Everything's online now. It's all free. Have a great life. You know, what do we do? Hope for that stimulus check again? Well, Janet, one thing I can think of is I think what we're going to see is that this difficulty, this time that we're going through has probably changed the music business for a long time. It's at least going to change the way we approach it. It's going to change the way um, artists record. It's uh, how they build their careers. I mean, the one thing we know is, is that music is never going to die is it that's the one thing we can uh, believe in because what it changes the heart it's what moves us um you know you've got three-year-old kids running around singing their little songs you know from the time from the cradle till we die we're listening to music and we're loving that song and oh that that song moved me all those things so i think the one thing we can hold on to is music is never going to die um what this may have happened, what may have happened here is it is going to change the way we make music, change the way we promote it, the way we market it, the way we get it to our fan base. So that's what I would tell the artist coming through is this is, it, it may be a whole new day, but what we've got to do is try to find a way to become better because of it and to look to the other side. That's what I told a friend of mine the other day. I was just belly aching right and left and saying, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Oh, got this problem, I've got this problem, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I finally said, you know what? I've got to find a way to turn the corner on this and look at it positively. How has this changed me in a positive way? And it's one of the reasons that I sort of started, and looking under the hood, Alexis, is a very good thought because I started thinking to myself, okay, what are some of the techniques that I do not have right now that would help me become better? And maybe I can in some way disseminate those to my students and show them how to, they can sit at home and create some of their own music, you know, sit at home and, and do some of these things and, and think about their careers and think about new ways to disseminate their music to people that would love to have uh, their music on their uh, on their iPod, uh, listen to me, iPod, on their iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, no. So uh, think about some of that. I think that music is never gonna die, but we've got to find a new way. Uh, and again, Alexis, look under the hood, figure out, it's a great phrase, figure out what, what has changed us after this? Yeah, you know what? This time has been a very difficult time. But the way my grandmother always told me is when you go through those difficult times and you, you, you bear through them and you get through them, guess what? It makes you better. Okay. And I think y'all can probably, I, I'm seeing some head shake. And so try to think of some ways that this can this can just make us help our students find new ways um and i with that any other thoughts i don't want to cut it off if somebody has a thought on any of that i i think yeah this is uh, alexis i'm seeing you Sorry, i've been there. chattering over there Here, i just you know, i love these things i love these kinds of things because they get me thinking i you know taking the time to stop like working and, and think about the sort of overarching situation that we're in. So thanks for letting me think with you. But I, you know, yeah, I was writing in the chat, like, um, you know, when my teachers graduated, they went on tour with, with the, everybody was touring back then. There was so much work. And by the time, you know, people my generation graduated, all that was over. And they're like, oh, I don't even know. We just, when you graduated, you just went to, and worked. And now I don't know what you're supposed to do, you kids. 
And now we're, you know, I'm looking at my kids and saying like, I don't know, when I, I had to find my own way, which was a difficult way as a performer, you know, all those years before I established myself. And, and now it's just the next level of that, you know? And I think, but I think, you know, thinking about like sites like Patreon and, um, you know, I've been producing my own concerts, just using my website, selling tickets on my website. I made a thousand dollars doing a home concert last in May. That's crazy, right? I just sat here at my piano in my cottage, but it's because of one-on-one -on -one fan engagement. And I think that really like, just like how we've gotten the middlemen out of so many other, like now you can make your own CD, you can release your own CD, all these things. Now it's just one-on-one -on -one artist to fan and the fan just pays the artist. <laughs> like, and, and there's no, we don't need all those people in between, even venues, even studios, even records. We don't even need the records. We just invite them into Label. our home and, and play music with them, you know? Yep. So I, I think it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna deepen our connection possibly with our fans. And I mean, I hate to put the burden on the fans because who knows what their situations are like, but there's plenty of people, <laughs> there's plenty of people with, you know, an extra, with a little bit of extra disposable income to still be spending on the arts and, and you know, that's, and it's going to make people feel the love more when that partnership is, when they realize that we're really supporting each other and that we have to. And also one of the things I hope for jazzvoice.com too, like maybe there'll be a resurgence in amateur music making through this, which is a real big hope of mine. I love, I'm a big fan of, of amateur singing and amateur music making. It's, it, they make great audience members, people who are amateurs and great students, dedicated students. And so I'm hoping that, um, that that's one of the things that can come out of this too. You know, if you can't go to a concert, maybe you can sing with your friends or sing, you know, in other ways. So anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very like a negative, but filled with hope at the same time. And I think that we, I mean, I would encourage your musicians and your artists and all those people you work with applied lessons and all that. I mean, there is a way to find, um, uh, we we're going to find a way to make music and 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 no matter what and we're going to find a way to make money from that okay one way or another i mean we're making music the copyright laws are all there you know so we're we're not going to those songs or whatever we're writing uh won't be given away for free there's always going to be those royalties there okay so remember that uh those have not gone away those performance rights royalties have not gone away they're going to be there and i would encourage your your singers that are writing songs before they uh and i just have to mention this because this is always the songwriting side has always been a part of my life from the time i was 25. um remind them that they do not if they're going to be singing their song out for the public if they're going to be posting it on uh, facebook all those sorts of things tell them if they've got three original songs that they have that they just wrote and they're just wanting to get out there and do their facebook live tell them to do a song form sr it's for sound recording library of congress uh, have them register that the library of congress then there is an official legal document that says that they wrote that first it's dated okay so and that the reason i say sr is if you do song form pa you have to pay 35 dollars per pop okay per song but i have encouraged my kids if you've got song form sr that is you're you're grouping those songs together as a song recording sound recording so if they that's 35 dollars for one form okay so then uh that that is a document that will hold up in a court of law okay so then they can go out and put it on facebook put it on everything you can think of and that starts and you know a uh, fan base is just a big part of and i think that's something we have to grow in our artists is to know that they have to build that fan base tell them to to keep dropping content and that's the way you start to get those people the fan base to rise up is if you keep dropping content there's going to be people to share that here and there all over the place and then you start to get that fan base and so then and people share it i've had a manager artist manager friend tell me that until that artist has a thousand shares not likes a thousand shares uh and and he's a good friend of mine from nashville until that artist has a thousand shares he will not even look at them to to try to manage them and 
uh, you know, that's something to think about. But, you know, just recently, uh, there was a guy that I, I have been working with a little bit, and his mama's been in the business a long time, and she's she's done gospel, and he's actually going to do country. But she had like 600,000 shares or something like that. And, I mean, just that's what starts to happen is those those one share turns into two or three or four, and then – then the managers start to go, oh, well, there's a way to make money. And one thing where artists are making money, some money these days, even though they're not doing performances, guess what they're making money on? Merchandise, okay? Because those fans all of a sudden want to have that Alexis Cole t-shirt or something, okay? <laughs> Look at her saying, no, they don't. Uh, William Powell t-shirt, you know? I mean, think about it. That's they start to want that because they love that music. They can't get enough of it. They want that hat that has the name across the front of it. They want a little bracelet, you know, they want a keychain. So there's going to be ways to make money at it. Don't let them think there's not. Any other thoughts? We're going to probably wrap this up in a few minutes. It's been a wonderful discussion, by the way. Any other thoughts? Hope, hope. We have hope, guys. The one thing I can encourage you to do is keep hope alive keep up alive and don't give up okay because i think we're all in the same boat we've got to encourage each other uh, armin i think you are going to send us out something and so we kind of will all have each other's emails and such um i i just i have loved that phrase from the time i was small keep hope alive and don't give up okay and um who said that? Was that Mark, Martin Luther King, I think, back in the day? There's so many things that he said that I love. Uh, oh, Jesse uh, Jackson. Uh, Jesse Jackson. Well, there's so many things that I think we can take from some of those great leaders that just say, don't give up. Okay, so applied teachers, ensemble directors, let's just, uh, as somebody said, let's look under the hood. Let's try to find ways that we can better ourselves we can continue to be educators that care about the kids of tomorrow, okay? That's why I think we do this, is we are trying to pass on our legacy. We have worked through this industry, and let me tell you, it's been uphill and downhill for me. I was one of those kids that moved to Nashville and didn't have anybody helping me and thought to myself, how in the world am I ever gonna do this? And then all of a sudden, I had a couple people hear me sing somewhere and went, hey, I wanna help you, and I was like, <gasps> what you actually want to help me okay i did i came here knowing nobody you know nobody so that's the thing is i think i have seen in my career there have been some important special people some who were educators who helped me along the way when i didn't have anybody else okay so that's who you are you are that person that's going to help somebody who's going to lead a kid into uh, being able to share their music with the world who had nobody else. Okay. So thank you for what you do. Armin, do you have any parting words? Just wanted to thank everyone for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, we will post this on YouTube. We always get a lot of hits there. I had over 50 people registered and I always get email asking if, if there's a link so they can join the conversation and continue the chat on there. So Thank you for giving us of your time. And hopefully we'll do, like I said, uh, another, you know, meet up maybe end of September and just kind of see how everybody's doing. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Take care. Bye guys. Thank you so much. Love you. Keep hope alive. Stay in